Okay. It, yeah. Do you remember me? Я думала, что это тот дом. Уйди, уйди. Куда уходить? За, за меня стань. За тебя. $399.9, which is a steal because I sold this for more than five years ago. did. Absolutely. And there have been improvements made since. All the windows are new. Oh, my. 
uh, imagine how that cuts down on the heating costs. I mean, it's amazing. And the current seller, who was also the last buyer, he did a lot of things last and give you orders. Hello, here's our famous clarinetist. Nice to see you. Paul, this is Paul. Paul Green. All right, so ready? We're going to move from the dining room. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Remove this. Thank you. So Paul, Paul is going to be on my TV <laughs> show soon. Nice to see you. I forgot to tell you that. Have you had a tour of this place? Well, now you're telling me. Are you ready to go on the tour? On the tour? Yes. Sure. I'm ready. Okay, tour. I love it. It's a big one. Let me go take it off. Sure. Let's talk to the boss on that. That's a lovely place. That's a kind of flyer. That looks great. Beverly, why don't you get things going? I am. Hi. Hi, guys. So we're going to start here, folks. You are to socialize when you dine. I am. I'm the major deal guest. Yes. So if you have something that is like these that you have with heels that was damaging, yeah, we'll say so okay? Uh, <laughs> this white Oh, look at that. Ooh. See, and that used to not be there. Whoever the buyer ends up being, they get first option to buy in a separate addendum any of the antiques that he's not taking. I like that it's so central in terms of it being in Pittsfield, but yes. looking out, you I wouldn't know. even, I mean, Dawes Avenue is, is a nice oh, street anyway, Dawes Dawes but that's so... Uh, now, Susan, you get an extra appetizer for that. No, oh. <laughs> I was hoping for something good like that. So, um, he has great taste, everything's to scale, and um, he's a collector of antiques, as you can see. Any questions so far? Oh, God. I'm going to move here in a minute. Well, I think that we should do a group, like a commune. And all the people together. Okay, so we'll take a look. You want to follow Sherry? <laughs> Sherry, the filter is well. And her lovely daughter, Autumn. What, what might this be? Pumpkin. <laughs> Got a bun in the oven? Yeah. Uh, you. That's Autumn, and that's Sherry's daughter. Oh my God. <laughs> okay, so here is another den. This one has um, obviously a pellet stove, so you can heat this house with pellets or with fireplaces or um, is it gas? <laughs> Oil. Anyway, hi. Nice to see you guys. Um, so, I have to tell you an interesting thing about this house before we go upstairs. What we have is, um, and obviously we have a hot tub out there, we have a uh, pool, which um, I got Jane from the ground up on the ground. Okay, my first showing, so please forgive me. Um, there's a lot of natural plantings here, trees, and landscaping that they have done. But the interesting story, in my opinion, is this used to be a duplex. And the reason it was a duplex is that we had two spinsters, old maids, and they're, they're elderly, and they hated each other. I don't mean dislike hate. But they were getting older and they were afraid to live alone, so they built twin houses, put them together. So if there was an emergency, well, obviously they were there for each other for, to call either the nearest nursing home or the ambulance, <laughs> or worse. Um, so they built this. You, you got to kind of imagine when we go upstairs, two houses being put together. Now, they did have one arrangement that I thought was quite clever. What they did is 
had one common room, which you'll see is now, you know, you're late, so Sorry. you Sorry. are minus one appetite. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in fact, Susan, you can get his, because you, you asked a good question. <laughs> now, we don't know why they hated each other that much, but what we do know is that he still had financial things to talk about, his bills, and one was not going to take over for the other. So they have one common room, which is now a walk-in closet that I would die for. Um, they would set the first day of each month, and they would meet. There's only two chairs in that room. They would sit, they would present the bills, and pay up your half. So it was absolutely the only communication they would have, unless, of course, emergencies. Well, obviously they're not here, and I don't think they died the sink. So what happened? We'll save that to the end. <laughs> okay, any questions so far before we go upstairs? Yes, Mr. Malinsky. Can I do the reading in here? You can pick whatever room okay. you want. Okay, I'm going to start with some people in here, and then people can join us. Or you need first. Only if you're going to repeat what you do, because we're doing, one more time, okay. tour, food, okay. talk, behave. That's my husband. <laughs> <laughs> he, he listens to me all the time. Right? <laughs> okay, so anybody? Any questions? No? You're a great, great group to tour around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How are you? What is there he is the butcher. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, would you like to go left or right? Why don't you guys, half of us, go that way because we will meet there. Oh, I see. So, this is one more than the other. Taj Mahal is all wrong. Nick, look at me. Have a little bumblebee. My mascot. I'm going to take her everywhere. Cool. I love it. Fireplace in every room, pretty much, right? Yeah, room. yeah, I can deal with that. Oh, oh, yes, wonderful. So you're going to hire me? Okay, I got a job out of this first day. Perfect. Um, okay, so feel free to roam around. Um, obviously, you can see. Yes? Oh, okay. Everything. I mean, I haven't seen something I don't like yet. And they even, you will notice, here's an office. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I look there too. No, you can file some of the paperwork if you'd like. You would appreciate the international writer. Yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh -huh. Eugene, look at this magic you created, right? Oh, Oh, Megan. Yeah, I need to take it. Folks, would you like to come in and eat? Yes. I'm inviting you to all come in here. Meg, Let's come in here and show This is incredible.
We started with, who knows, I got a list of Berkshire area writers, and not just Berkshire, but also as far as Albany, uh, as, you know, I mean, as, as far as south as Hartford, Connecticut, etc. And we got to, we got to Catherine Sedgwick, who was a famous author from Stockbridge, and, and, and Teddy indicated that her, uh, I think, is it, is Kyra Sedgwick, how is she related? Kira, Kira Sedgwick, Kira, Kira Sedgwick, yeah. She's, uh, she's married to Kevin Bacon, the actor, and she belongs to the Sedgwick family at Stockbridge. Yes, it's That's kind of a uh, very strong software. Oh. A good bloodline, let's Just put it that way. <laughs> Just so I can see these people. You want to sit here? Yeah. I'll switch. Sure. Just so I can see everybody, okay? Yes. <laughs> you can still see? Yeah, stay right here. Okay, so the idea behind my presentation was for me to read something, but I'm not a real fan of listening to people read. So what I also prepared is maybe I, I did some research on the internet to find out what writers lived and wrote here, what well, especially famous dead writers, not not people who are still living because we wouldn't want to offend those that we didn't mention. So we got to we got to Catherine Sedgwick. That's how far we are at this at this stage. But I have a, a list of others. If you if you know of anybody you want to share with with others here, please do. Who else is from and around around this area? Mark Twain, right? Hartford. Hartford. He lived there for a significant period of time. Well, the guy who wrote Moby Dick, right? Yeah. Right. Right. Melbourne. Melbourne. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Which is just like two miles down the road yeah. from here. And the yeah. post office is another one. Yeah. And Hawthorne and Melville were friends. Yeah. And Yeah. Right. And how do you know Hawthorne? Oh, you were saying Edith Wharton. Oh, and Edith Wharton. Oh, Edith Wharton. Yeah. 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 Well, here's what Edith had to say. Oh, You know, she was not a famous fiction writer until after she became famous for writing about architecture. So she had already been famous. So she was writing about. You know, not just interior architecture, <laughs> but landscaping and, and so forth. Anyway, she said proportion is is, oops, is is in her in her view proportion was the ultimate in architecture. And this house doesn't it sort of kind of isn't in proportion in a way. So that's that's sort of why I thought well this house seems like an Edith Wharton. Home, doesn't it? This house, we can all live in this house. Yeah, yeah. all of us. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what, you know what Edith said about the Berkshire? She was she's only here 10 years before she divorced her husband, Teddy. Teddy? That's I it. think it was, it was Edward. That's, a, that's enough Teddy. time with any man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and not that too much time. And, and the, the Mount is the first house she ever built from, from bottom up. Anyway, just add whatever you want. Just add in if, if you have information that I don't know. Her architecture was uh, carried over into her place, and especially with the gardens. I the gardens, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. She well, she spent a lot of time in in France and a lot of time in Italy and in England. And and the, the mount is actually uh, an idea from British architecture, but she made some adjustments to it. What What do you know about Oliver Wendell Holmes? I don't have anything here about homes. I would ask somebody I didn't look up. Does anybody know if it's hard? Yeah, we're right here. We're right here. Yeah, he was from here, wasn't he? Yeah. I'm not familiar with the so He was a justice. I missed him. Was a lot. All of the homes was a justice of the Supreme Court. And a poet. He wrote some, wrote some pretty outstanding opinions for the yeah, time. He was a very yes. famous justice. Yes. He was also asked the meaning of life. And everybody gave all convoluted explanations of the meaning of life. And Holmes says the meaning of life is simply to function. 
everyday function. Simple. And how do you go about doing that? That's a hard <laughs> by, by contributing to society yeah. in any way, shape, or form that you deem fit. Are we talking only about dead writers? Talking about holes. Oh, yeah. No, primarily dead writers. I didn't want to offend people who are still alive. But you can hey. mention some of the stuff. I think it was quote attributable. To Teddy, I think Holmes was friends with Hawthorne and Melville and Longfellow. Yeah. I think they all kind of knew each other back and forth from Holmes. Melville and, Mel yeah. and Hawthorne were best friends. Best of friends. And, As and a then, matter of fact, I don't think Melville would have written serious stuff he did without Hawthorne's encouragement. I'll tell you, Longfellow was in love with the Appletons, yeah. one of the Appletons. I didn't know that. Yes, yeah, so we're at Pittsfield High School. Oh, At least that's where they're going. Okay. There, there's, a, there's a small book that I'd like to recommend. It's called uh, October Mountain, I think, that in which Paul has published a couple of short stories. Thanks, John. And, and, um, <laughs> It's about Berkshire writers. It's all about Berkshire. Published by Paul Metcalf. Paul Metcalf. He's no longer with us. He's a, a great grandson of Melville. His work was hybrid work. It was really, quite frankly, beautiful. It was in a lot of small journals, you know, one of the late journals and stuff. Like that. And he's a great fellow. Teddy knew Paul yeah. Metcalf, and so did Peter. Is that book still in print? Huh? Is that book still in print? Yeah, I think it's. I don't think it's in print, but you can find it. I I, I found a, a copy at the at the Pittsfield Library, so it's, it's a it's, it's an excellent. Here's here's who else I I just did some research through the internet and I thought maybe I'd share some of it. But Henry David Thoreau hiked Greylock, and what happened was is he hiked it with Hawthorne, so to speak, right, or Emerson, and then what happened was Hawthorne wrote stories about Mount Greylock. So if you look at some of his short stories, he was essentially the first American to, to produce short stories that were perceived as an art form. And probably the first American writer that wasn't somehow influenced by the Europeans, because remember we came here, what, 1620, the Puritans came? So all they were writing at that time was, you know, uh, sermons, um, I think Jonathan Edwards centers in the hands of an I angry God. Just just Jonathan like Edwards <laughs> Church in in, uh, in Northampton, and that was one of the first things that was written that wasn't purely about religion per se. Except um, what happened was, is Washington Irving began to write stories that were perceived as American work before before the Puritan influence and so forth, and uh, so he was. He was born in Terrytown, New York, which is not all that far away, right? You know, so. Something similar happened in the world of, compos of uh, composition in the 19th century. This, American this, composers young, this were... young fella is a musician. Really? Uh, not only that, he is a Harvard graduate. Yale graduate. What? Oh. Yale, Yale graduate. Oh, oh my God. I don't ever have a chance to ever talk again. Yeah, I, must, I must ask you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, we have a lot of very, very interesting, impressive people here. I just want to interject that because Paul, and we have I'm a lot so of people proud of him, and I forget impressive. that, Me. you know, 40 years of marriage, I'm looking around to see who's next. You look at the psychiatrist. Who's next? Yeah. Who's next? Well, because I have a heart problem, so she's looking to see. Next. I invited you all here so I could check you out. <laughs> Uh, I'm kidding. Well, in, in any case, to, to go back to the <laughs> conversation, how would you like to have her in your house? Yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> or she, she'd be in the doghouse right away. But anyway, um, the um, the American school of composition in the 19th century kind of the, the, the composers kind of had an inferiority complex, and, um, because they were basically trying to write like European composers and. In the 19th century, a famous Czech, Czechoslovakian or Czech composer, Antonin Dvorak, came over to the United States, and he was very impressed by the culture here, and he wrote a big symphony, which is still played a lot today. It's called the New World Symphony, the Symphony from the New World, in which he was very consciously trying to incorporate American-sounding themes into his piece. And what happened is that 
he made the situation even worse for American composers because the piece that he wrote was so much greater than anything that any of them could write that they just kind of went even further into their shell. It really wasn't into the tw until the 20th century uh, when composers were overtly trying to really create an American school, uh, the most important of which was Aaron Copeland. Well, really I have a question for you. Yeah. Will you remember what you said verbatim? Because he's coming on my smile with the Mao show, and I would like you to repeat everything you've said. And Paul is going to be singing or playing the national anthem at our Lacona <laughs> Ballpark. So he's also Paul. What day is that? I think it's July 27th, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, I might be calling on a second. I, 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 second. I think it's still July. I, I wouldn't swear. I, I think so. I will put that out there. It's in my appointment. Book, so. so don't forget to talk about that because um, you're yeah. very interesting in yourself. He's also a lawyer. I brought him along. Not so anymore. I, I, I resigned from the. No, I don't blame him. I don't, I don't practice yeah. law. So, so Paul, I missed the Beverly, beginning. Uh, can I, I can I continue? <laughs> Wow. See, after 40 years, you can bicker and get away with it. Anyway, I just want to go th through a few of these authors that are somehow associated <laughs> with the Irish. Do you know Sinclair Lewis oh, yes. was the first American to win a Nobel Prize? No, I didn't know. Interestingly, he was up for the Pulitzer at exactly the same time as Edith Wharton was. But Edith Wharton's dad and family, her, her maiden name was Jones. And the saying, keeping up with the Joneses, comes from her family. They were so wealthy. They're on West 23rd Street in New York, and he made all of his money just like our lovely president has through real estate. <laughs> so what happened was, is Sinclair Lewis had already been nominated by the nominating committee for the Pulitzer, and someone from the Jones family went into that nominating committee and took him off the list and put Edith in instead. <laughs> oh. oh no. Now, not that she didn't deserve an award. I mean, she's a lovely, wonderful writer. But he got lucky. Shortly after that, he won the Nobel. But do you know where he lived? Yeah. In Williamstown. Oh. He was there for five years. No kidding. And you, you can probably still see the place. It was the Carmelite Fathers took over his place. It's on Ob Oblong Road. Is if you're driving into Williamstown on Route 7, and if you take a left on Route 2 and sort of head toward Troy, if you look down into the valley off of Route 2, that's where the, his home was at that time. So, But it doesn't exist anymore. The Carmelite Fathers had it for a while. I think it may still exist as a location. But I don't, I don't think it's a monastery anymore. But after he left, which is really interesting, because he was alcoholic, so who would take it next but individuals who didn't drink? Um, no. So anyway, he, uh, Wallace Stevens, does anybody know him? I think he's just the greatest poet. Safety. Anyway, he also lived in uh, Hartford. So we had Mark Twain up there, and Wallace Stevens from 1879 to 1955. And North Bennington, who do you think lived there? Shaftesbury and North Bennington. Robert Frost. There's even a small museum now in Shaftesbury for Robert Frost. And Shirley Jackson. Remember the short story, The Lottery? She lived in North Bennington. Hmm for a long period of time. It's and still it's, home to the Yeah. It's, uh, if you've never read that short story, it is maybe one of the one of the most spectacular short stories ever written. You've got you got to get a chance if you get a chance to that one. Then you know who lived in Cummington? Anybody? E. E. Cummings. That's no, right. E. E. Cummings. E. Cummings. E. Cummings. E. Cummings. <laughs> Can you imagine trying to teach one in our class? <laughs> Richard Wilbur. <laughs> Richard Wilbur. Yes. And he is a U.S. Poet Laureate. He just died last year. And Paul had and, the honor and, of being yeah. um, Paul with him. I, I did a reading no, with him. He actually did a reading. And <laughs> William Cullen Bryant had written Thanatopsis there. And uh, what's interesting about Richard Wilbur, he called me aside one time and he said, you know, 
Thanatopsis, which is which is William Cullen Bryant's famous poem, right? He says, you know, that is a beautiful poem. He says, but generally he's a terrible poet. <laughs> so then Beverly and I went to Camden, Maine to see Edna St. Vincent Millay's statue. And she's also over here in Austerlitz, New York. There's a, a place where she used to live in Austerlitz. And Edna Still used to fun. sleep with whomever she felt like, male, female, her, her husband sometimes, sometimes his friend. She was a real character. So we went to see her, and she's a great uh, sonneteer. Uh, I remember um, um, Wilbur saying to me, he said, do you know something? That gal could write a sonnet. So he, I mean, he is a marvelous, marvelous writer, great critic, but he loved her sonnets, and her sonnets were superb. <clears throat> so if you ever get a chance to read a great sonnet, read in the St. Vincent Millay sonnet. So we went to see, she was born in Rockport, Maine, but uh, what's the town we were at? Camden. Camden is right next door. If you've not had a chance to visit Camden, I recommend it to you. Mm -hmm. We've started to vacation Beautiful. based on where authors live. Yeah. Then we went to Exeter, New Hampshire to see where John John Irving was born and brought up. And he was right next to the Phillips Exeter Academy. He was adopted and his home is stunning, it's just unbelievable. I always had this perception because I went to school with him at Iowa and I had this perception that he came from a family that was impoverished, but that wasn't so at all. It's from a beautiful, beautiful place. Have you ever visited Exeter? That's another place worth visiting. Beverly and I stop and we, we go to places where authors either lived or grew up or whatever, and our vacations sort of surround those locations. How about John Ashbery, the famous homosexual poet? Does anybody know about him at all? Hudson, New York, just died last year. Mm -hmm. That's where he he's from Rochester originally, then went to New York City, became extraordinarily famous, and then moved with his, his husband to Hudson, and the two lived there for a long period of time. If you haven't visited Hudson, it's a beautiful little place. Do you like it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It's very special. We used to take, I had an agent in New York City, and we used to take the train, Amtrak, from Hudson. Then the last time we went in, we took the... Uh, the train. Amtrak? No, we no. We used to take Amtrak, but oh. the last time we went in, we took the the train from Wasail, oh, yeah. which which is yeah Metro North, and so that we did great. that the last time. But anyway, and I already did William Kennedy. I just want to go through the list of these fascinating people. Are you and, going to read anything, or did I miss? Yeah, it? I'll, I'll, just one second. <laughs> and if if you haven't done anything with Robert Lowell, who used to be a professor at Harvard. And he had all these women, he had this coterie of women poets, and many of them became extraordinarily famous. They all wanted to get into his class so much, and he would pick and choose who was going to be there. And then he had a mental health issue that was really severe. So one of the things that happened is sometimes he'd show up to class, and sometimes he'd miss half of the semester, and someone would have to take over. But the poets that he had, that had been teaching there, where a lot of them were confessional poets, like Anne Sexton. If you've not read any of her work, it's just absolutely beautiful. And Sylvia Plath. And I just had uh, three poems accepted to the Sylvia Plath, Plath publication uh, from the University of Indiana. And I spent a little bit of time following her poetry. Her poetry is just absolutely superb. She married Ted Hughes, who cheated on her, and then she committed suicide shortly afterward. Anyway, I may or may not have been related to Ted Hughes, but I think his poetry was inferior to hers. He taught at the University of Massachusetts, by the way. And I want to ask you, do you know who Charles Pierce Burton is? Does anybody know who Charles Pierce Burton is? Is this Jeopardy? Yeah, this is a <laughs> this is this is a What is? What is? There's, there's a series of books called the Bob's Hill. Peter, you know about those, don't you, the Bob Sill books? They're all about Adams, Massachusetts, <laughs> up near the Forest Park Country Club. You want to learn about teenage kids and escapades going into caves and so forth. And they're very, very popular. <laughs> then I'm going to give you my five, one and only, and then I'll read you one thing of mine, OK? Marianne Moore, my favorite poet. She died uh, 1972. 
All of her work, pretty much all of her work, was published in the New Yorker. She's from Missouri originally. Then Ernest Hemingway, Oak Park, Illinois, was born there. He had nothing to do with the Berkshires whatsoever. I don't think he's ever been here, but Flannery O'Connor, Savannah, Georgia. Oh. And my favorite poet of all is Emily Dickinson. I just think she's just absolutely superb. And I walk around Amherst and just get the vapors, you know. Yeah. And then another person who's one of my favorites is James Holtzauer. Does anybody know James Holtzauer? The guy in Jeopardy? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> if you have not watched him on Jeopardy, you've yeah. got to see so him. So now you're talking about dead authors, and now you're writing for somebody who's not You want me to read one thing? Yes. Okay. Why don't I read a humorous piece? No. I got, I got a piece here where I was finalist for a Mark Twain award, <laughs> and they gave the money to somebody else. You know, it's interesting about, about winning competitions is some people get the money and then you just get a runner-up prize. <laughs> they already have figured out where the money's going to. They just need to have people, you know, apply. Okay. Oops, not that one. Want to hear one about rigs? Rigs? Yeah. Austin. Austin rigs. This is a short, humorous piece, and I won't bug you after this. I write a piece every day. Oh, oh wow, that's great. That's so wow. At least a poem, if not a poem, sometimes uh, a short story, etc. This one's called The Captive. I think you'll get a kick out of it. This <laughs> one, a kick out this <laughs> one, a runner up prize for the Mark Twain Humor Award in Hartford. Nobody else wanted it after that. Riggs is the famous psychiatric clinic on Main Street in Stockbridge. The exterior of its main building is all whitewashed brick and the interior waiting area has on the wall above the large Italian leather sofa a portrait of Eric Erickson. Ladies. <laughs> I recall Dr. Erickson as the developmental stage theorist who said that at age 70 my ego should be waging war between integrity and despair. Remember, only I'm just 50, and my ego is not waging war, but it is undeniably engaging in successive battles. My wife, Barbara, said I need therapy. Oh, you've got insurance, don't you? Go. The receptionist was not an impenetrable beauty. She was pleasantly matronly with wavy silver hair and a smooth, calming voice. She said, your name, sir? I'm Bard. James Bard, I said. She got my aged James Bond joke and smiled. Dr. Sheba's waiting for you, Mr. Bard. Second level, last door on the right. I took the stairs, posture erect, just one at a time, the way those who are waging an ego war are supposed to. Riggs has lots of doctors. DR, PhD, MD, 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 and a couple licensed social workers, LICSW, LICSW. Dr. Sheba's door was open, so I poked my head in. Dr. Sheba was beautiful. Shiny ebon hair slicked to the side of her head, smooth skin with a tint of caramel, the Sheba part. And large almond eyes, she smiled, showing pearly white teeth and rosy red lips. Are you Dr. Sheba? I asked stupidly, trying to solicit a clever response like maybe she might say, just her alter ego. She smiled and hand signaled to the chair across from her desk, exactly as therapists on television do. Well, her appearance was Middle Eastern, her accent Germanic Austrian. <laughs> Appropriately psychological, I am very, very happy to see you. Barbara has spoken so much of you. <laughs> this was her idea, I said. I believe I'm too stubborn to benefit from this, uh, although, excuse me, I understand. Just by the fact that you have been chosen to work here, you must uh, be very good at what you do. She smiled kindly. Barbara has informed me that you might be skeptical, even in this day and age. 
I'm getting older and I saw the portrait of Eric Erickson downstairs. He was hardly a fan of the agent. On the contrary, we are all fans of the ages. I said aged. Oh, in that case, I had better begin quickly before you expire, should I not? With this clever retort, Dr. Sheba got even better looking with the absolutely right amount of intelligence and charm. We will begin mid their history, should we not? I was going to say, we should. I just nodded, willingly entranced. I reported to Barbara that I felt that the first session was indeed productive. See, she said. I told Dr. Sheba that at age 50, without much time to lose, I'm, I ought to spend right. I ought to speed right along to the primary burning issue of my life. My inability to shop for and give meaningful gifts to Barbara or to anyone, not just on anniversaries, but at any time. I reported to Barbara what I shared with Dr. Sheba. And that was what I had repeated to Barbara numerous times over the years, that at age five, I thoughtfully picked a bouquet of dandelions for my mother, who on receipt gave them an underhand toss into the river, snarling that I should have known the difference between flowers and weeds. Dr. Sheba said, oh, well, oh, my. She was truly impressed by my lifelong pain begun with my mother's rejection. Right. Barbara, Barbara, I knew, I knew I, you'd like this piece. I have a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of other choices. Barbara nodded knowingly. This is why she had insisted in my therapy after all. She had suffered from the result of my pain, a man without a sense of occasion. During, I like that line. I don't know. <laughs> during, during, during the second visit, I opted for the Paisley Fabric Easy Chair so I could look out the window onto Main Street and Stockbridge. I immediately had the sense that Dr. Sheba knew this was a ploy, that I would not give up so much during this and succeeding sessions. I had decided, had I not, that life was meant to be lived, not just contemplated and confessed. I spoke about my overriding need. I knew clearly at age 12 that I was a confirmed heterosexual. Beatrice Stanek sat in front of me in English class. She would flip her blonde hair back, place her whimsical head over her shoulder and smile. I was smitten and wanted to please. And what you did? <laughs> well, what do you mean, va? I almost said what. <laughs> when Beatrice smiled, I lost my breath. I tried to smile back. I made a veritable fool of myself right there in the classroom. I fell out of my seat. Remember Dante and Beatrice? <laughs> so you recovered from the ignominy and learnt this was their proper feeling for you, yeah? Yes, it was. And why is this a problem? It isn't a problem really that I know. I'm just something to talk about because I'm here. I'm supposed to talk about things, no? <laughs> Dr. Sheba smiled and nodded. I told her about all the years I spent as slave to women. How I could not control myself at all around them. Well, not just around them, actually any place within sniffing distance. <laughs> how this became problematic in relationships. How after a very short time I spoiled, I spoiled them all. How they all began telling me what to do and bossing me around, and I was so complicit and ultimately resentful. Z enabler, aha. Uh -huh. Even with Barbara, I continued and droned down, and then ultimately confessed, I mean, I'm not here of my own free will. I'm here because Barbara said I should use my insurance. <laughs> and, and, and are we using their insurance? And will it be insurance well spent? Yeah, well, yes, I guess. Because Barbara, she has told you? No. Barbara was right. Dr. Sheba was a beautiful woman, and I was a sucker for her and became more so as the sessions progressed. High intelligence, a sense of humor, given the circumstances and the confirmed reputation of Riggs for seriousness and mental health, great dresser, pretty ears that framed her face and allowed her hair to rest on them in soft, wispy <laughs> curls, brown eyes. Distinct smile lines, a hint of rouge, or was it just her corpuscular pink rising to the surface of her caramel skin? Barbara asked me how things were going. Oh, they're going good. <laughs> so there, it is worthwhile after all. I told you Dr. Sheba is a pleasant person, competent, very able, 
attractive? Oh yeah, they are, yeah. <laughs> Quite by transfer, I did say them. <laughs> I told Dr. Sheba that 10 sessions would be about right. And after that, I would likely fall into redundancies and a trivial. Not nine sessions, I heard that correctly, no? Not even 11 sessions, which is yet again another number? Yes, 10 ought to, and I caught myself, how utterly stupid to quantify the number of sessions before improved mental health, before the ignorant suppositions about self are erased by truthful confession. So it continues. This was your interrupting. This was affecting me, the accent, engaging in rapid please? therapeutic transference. I am so serious, this passion, even at my age, is unrelenting. I love the way women talk, the way they carry themselves, their spaying hips, and their indefatigable breasts. Barbara can make me do whatever she wants. Would you buy this and, house? And, and, <laughs> and, and this is a problem, Dr. Sheba asked. I feel sometimes I begin to take on their habits. Or or their mannerisms, and have lost their part of me that is genuinely me. I have lived like that, I'm afraid. My entire life as a masculine creature has devolved into some utter creature controlled unmercifully by their female. Anima animus, fair and square. Yeah, of course, Dr. Sheba says, wouldn't it be great if their life was fair? But it's not, I said. It depends on their perspective. At 50, I'm still ruled by the contrary charms of the opposite sex. Though their whole life since from their first awareness with Beatrice, yeah. As instructed, I met Barbara at the lion's den, the basement dining, dining nook of the Red Lion Inn. She wore the short plaid skirt that I am passionate about and her black spiked heels. During a la carte lamb and red wine, I kept peeking under the table, referencing her elegant ankles and pretty red-toed feet. I also kept noticing her beautiful red lips and indeterminate smile lines. Barbara smiled sapiently in confirmation, and after dinner we left for home, enamored in a giddy romantic anticipation. On the nightstand near our bed, Barbara had placed a bud vase with a single yellow flower. A dandelion, of course. In sheer penoir, she straddled my naked torso, swinging hypnotically from her neck the heart-shaped locket I had thoughtfully purchased without my usual, usual fear of rejection. During our amorous entwining, I must admit, I did think of Dr. Sheba. But for a moment when Barbara's <laughs> hand resembled Dr. Sheba's caramel skin. Then when Barbara dropped down to press her rosy red lips against my trembling cheek, and when her locket fell against my heaving chest, I thought only of her, slavishly only of her, and well, oh well, truthfully, also of upcoming session number 11. <laughs> 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 I think I should have got the thousand bucks they gave it to somebody from Hartford. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Oh, okay. Thank you. Isn't this a great house? Yes. Oh, oh yeah. My goodness. Anna has something she wants to be. Sure. Anna. Anna's a graduate of Smith, by the way. Just for you to know. How far is the air from And you know who else? You know who used to teach there? Sylvia Plath used to teach there. Oh, really? Not only did she teach there, but she was superb, a superb, superb teacher. Oh, wow. It's good to do our homework on Paul. Wasn't he fantastic? Yeah. I mean, talk about the Berkshire author. My first language was Polish. Just say, like, Hemingway? Is that another one that he enjoys? Hemingway? Anyway, I had the pleasure of knowing Paul, his lovely wife, Beverly, for many years. We go back, what, about 30 years? And and so I was there at their kitchen table when Paul was doing his first works in fiction. And I want to read something that he has written. Fiction, compositionally. <laughs> Uh, fiction is a wordplay best engaged in by those who have found most work in our world terribly tedious and non-constructive. 
editorially, editorially fiction refines the result of this play, delivers it lucidly in print to others for their amusement and consideration. Fiction writers are born old, grow young, they seek the truth our senses capture but deny. Fiction is thus the conscience of our senses. Fiction writers, the playful penmen of this conscience. Paul Polensky. Oh. Uh, if anyone is interested in some of his early writings, uh, we have a wonderful novel, novelette, I don't know what you would call it, it's called Sexual Rhythms. Uh, and it was no. wonderful. <laughs> and uh, who, who did the cover again? Uh, Julio. Julio. Julio Grande, one of our yes. local mm -hmm. artists, and who else? Marilyn Grande is, if you want to tell a little bit of how that came about, but I, before you do, Paul, we have several authors in this room. Oh, yeah. oh, if you would yeah. introduce yourself. Oh, please. Um, I just found out. Who's writing? Raise your hand if you're a writer. She knows you from way back. Who, me? Yeah. Oh, me? I'm Cynthia Gardner, yeah. I just. Yes, I said. Hi, no, I was just walking around the neighborhood and I saw my city councilor selling his house. And I thought, yeah. why is he selling his house? And then I happened upon this. So. Oh, how nice of you to stop by. As I started author, writing poetry five years ago. Oh. And it's finally starting to place after five years of having written fiction from age from the age of 16 when I first learned English. I thought I would be able to just smoothly segue into poetry, but it took me five years before others have indicated that they felt it was good enough to publish. Yeah, it's great so to have a change yeah. to move on to something else. Yeah. Do you write poetry also? Yes. Uh -huh. I, I only have one chapbook. So far. I just, I have so much, to, to, I spend so much time writing, I don't send out except as people ask me to send something, and occasionally for a competition, you know. That's it. Nice to meet you. Who else is writing? Teddy. No, no, no this, is, this is interesting because Teddy and I have known each other for over 30 years, haven't we, Teddy? Right. How many novels have you finished in 30 years? 18. Teddy is, Teddy is up to 18 novels. How many have I sold? <laughs> well, no. that's immaterial. <laughs> He's also a great <laughs> Do you know Hawthorne? He had no money. He had been fired from his job. Yeah. Was renting a place in, in, in uh, Stockbridge and Lennox, right near Tanglewood, where he wrote Tanglewood Tales. He didn't have a penny to his name. And all of a sudden started writing, you know, selling. Hawthorne. Yeah, magic. So, hang in there. Thank you. You know who's the best one? Who? Oh, Miller Fillmore. No kidding. His, his college roommate was Miller oh. Fillmore. And, and one of our most famous presidents. And, and Fillmore appointed him ambassador to England, I think. And, and because he, he wasn't making any money as an author. Yeah, he wasn't his, making any money. Oh, and he lost his job in the, in the county house or whatever it was. Isn't that something? Well, but how about, how about a poem? Want to do one poem? I'll do one. If, if, you're, if you're in a hurry to leave, don't worry. I got a bunch of poems that I put together. Here, does, does anybody like Cape Cod? I wrote, I wrote a poem about Cape Cod. Eighth wonder of the world. Eighth wonder of the world, Cape Cod. Elbowed coast of unbridled sandy beaches. It's a cool line that, that breaks against the shore below the green, stark, antique lines. He's a little snake. She's a We've been married 40 years, and it, it gets longer every day. The, the, fog, the fog makes Portugal invisible. And dawn steps in to show the way the cod have gone. A seagull reminds us in its intrepid flight, it is not just the sea, but the salt air that claims the land. Wait for the bird to still in flight, listen to its call. The torment is its will, it will 
teach the man. In comfort walking shore, the fastest pace is slow, and his straightest line is the tide line's curvature. Except by the cruel beauty of perfection, the cape preserves us still, and harbors and still the will, our wild Atlantic gifts itself to us. Right. Beautiful, beautiful place, isn't it? Now I'll just read you one by Edna St. Vincent, about Edna St. Vincent Lily. She is a character for quite a while. I got stuck on her. She was such a personality. This is Edna and the Comanche. These are early poems. Most of the ones I write now are metaphorical. Wait, um, is he real? Yeah. On the schooner from Camden Harbor, we could see Edna's bronze statue. In the town park below the town library, west of the granite amphitheater shared, shaded by leaf. If anyone's interested, we have the books. What do you got going there? She's promoting. Sexual rhythm. Oh. <laughs> Sexual rhythm. Sexual rhythm. Sexual rhythm. Sexual Yes, I do. Huh? Yes. Want me to read it? Yes. Well, let, me, let me start again. Okay. Then I won't bother you with that. Because I, 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 I write one or two a day. On the schooner from Camden Harbor, we could see Edna's bronze statue. In the town park, below the town library, west of the granite amphitheater, shaded by leaf. You have not gone to Camden, please go, what a place. A schooner has two masts and a delivery of sails that helps race the boat at seven knots over ocean water faster than a couplet. Edna's statue was bigger than life with a big head. If she showed emotion, I didn't see it. Her preference, and as teen, her insistence, was to be called Vincent. Some did, as some still do, but aft was a Comanche, a visitor to Camden from Oklahoma, who sat alone on the deck, his feet propped against the thin line of bulkhead and rigging. His hair was Indian black, his eyes brown, his face had high cheekbones, innocent in nature. I could see his nostrils in air, inhale vapor from the water and his eyes cloud up in the mist. We flew over the ocean as fast as his tribe rode over the prairie on Appaloosas. I could see the Comanche knew better than Edna, or Vincent as you prefer, that the ocean was a prairie and the schooner was a pony that ran down Buffalo before the white man shot them all and sent my friend to Camden to share his mist-born tears with Edna, or Vincent, if you prefer. Yeah. They're starting to suck. For those of you who are all done, please. I have a poet and I are going to share with you right here. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. It's good to see you. I hope you so enjoyed much. that story. Yes, it was. I, I love the story. It because there are so many therapists I us. love it. <laughs> Taking histories of parents in trouble, simple words express tragic lives without poetry and care and protection. While others write of themselves, I write of others for purpose. Children placed in state care are in a gray limbo of life. What is best for the children follows. A way out of poverty is one. A rich trickle-down is another. Bluebirds refusing fence posts is the last. Parents in despair opt for substances to use, to sell, to purchase diapers with. With text that can be expunged at will, the children become life poems to the court. Unsustained, unpolished green apples, the children are painted in words. What a job. You know, sometimes, uh, I've just been learning about poetry. Sometimes a poem is just a photograph, you know? Yeah. There's some really wonderful poem, uh, poets that are just essentially taking word photographs. So I experiment with something every day, you know, some new way of doing it. I write a sonnet or I'll write a very, very short poem that's not haiku, but still has a rhythm to it. You know? What time of day do you write? I, I write whenever I can. First thing in the morning, sometimes I'll get up at five, and I'll have written by noon. You know? So I, I, I work a lot of hours, and I almost never write at night anymore. I used to write a lot at night, too. Um, I used to write just around the clock. 
I have so much work I don't even know where it is or what it is anymore. I, sometimes I'll pick it up and I'll go, that's not bad. I wonder who wrote it. <laughs> uh, this is just a photograph of it. On a cold winter morning, the only leafy branch on the dogwood is a short, straw thin, broken one that hangs from a larger branch that swings in the wind. There are no other broken branches and no other leaves, just our fortuitous one with a pink sky circle and evanescent halo in the cold winter mornings. The branch, if it could have chosen, may have snapped or broken to release from the rest but it hangs loosely as it is, a singular vivid force remaining in sight. A chickadee with a tree full of branches on which to land chooses our branch, attach, attaching its little claws to the leaves. It swings itself in the wind, its black cap against the pink sky circle and evanescent halo in the cold winter morning sun. Just a picture. <laughs> Very yeah, I, I got enough for a couple collections. If anybody knows any publishers, let me know. That would be great. I mean, we could do something with photography and and the poems. I think that's not been done and would be very, very popular. Um, T.S. Eliot did the thing with cats, but no one's ever done anything with birds because it takes so, so long to observe them. You know? what, what about the story? I, I, I don't know if you have it with you, but... The story about the bird on the fence? I didn't bring it. Like, that keeps selling, you know? That, that's a most, fantastic story. Most, most people are writers. If they get one good story that lasts beyond their lifetime, that's a lot. Like mm. Shirley Jackson's The Lottery. I mean, it's a classic and it will last forever. I've had about four or five poem, uh, stories that keep selling, you know, one after another. And at one point, it was only tickets. I had a story, had a story mm -hmm. called Tickets. And it's sold South Africa, the Ukraine, Russia, Poland, Denmark, China. But there's also, I have a couple others that keep selling, too. And then, uh, there's a, some movie based on this story. Movie? Yeah, there was a movie. Yeah. 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 This is only movie the only movie that's oh, yeah, that's I, real I, don't, I don't send out very often. I just sit home and write all the time. I need I need someone to come into the house and look through. At one time, one of these young ladies was going to do that for me, but she's a young person with a career and she's looking to move forward in her career. Um, but uh, that would be a tremendous help because I don't even know what happened so much. I have boxes and boxes. Um, Emily Dickinson, she had sent out stuff initially, her father, and Beverly keeps pushing me to send things. But Emily Dickinson's father sold a couple of poems for her to Springfield Union. And what happened was, is Emily then started to send out some of them and just got rejected over and over and over. People didn't understand what she was writing. I mean, can you imagine not understanding? So she just stopped and she just read it. And when she died, her sister found boxes of material and put it together. Have, have you pursued anything for someone? You know, actively or? Yeah, I, you know, I just need someone to put this stuff together and start looking for a publisher. This is a great book, you know, Berkshire's, you have people from all over. Yeah, you know, six you know, degrees I, of separation. it takes energy though, you know, to do, to sell and to write are two different things. Yeah. Well, absolutely, that's yeah. with my stories. The yeah. sad part about it is so many people who are great self-promoters have no talent. Yeah, some do. Which I mean, I can say that Zimbalay was a wonderful poet. She really was. She was not a very nice human being, but why she could write, she could. Did you see the movie, The Biopic, about her? No, I didn't. A couple of years ago. It was pretty, pretty dull. They had great costumes. And yeah, it was, it was, there's so you know, much. Well, she, she, was, was a, she was a gifted poet when she was oh, very yeah. young in high school. Oh, yeah. And someone found her in some poems. Yeah. And this lady bought her tuition. Oh, wow. That's been wonderful. What did you say there? Otherwise, she wouldn't have been able to view for it to go to college. Oh. <laughs> do that something. Very oh, well. yes, so it is. So you love poetry, don't you? I do. Mm -hmm. I do. My grandson is now Do you write poetry? 
Yeah. A little bit. But my grandson oh, is now oh, eight. Wow. Yeah. Eight. He's an okay And look holiday. at this. He's up. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. They can't test him until he's yeah. uh, at least nine or ten years old. Yeah. yeah. This is for some water. He loves it. Yeah. Oh, my. He loves it. Do you think he's a mental? Yeah, I think he's a mental. I'm coming out of one side. I'm coming out on the other side. Dr. Seuss is from Springfield. <laughs> it's Mulberry Street is where he was born. Oh, no, I was just kidding. I would imagine he's probably read all of Dr. Seuss's material. There's someone who's made a good use of you know, the limited vocabulary that you could use for, for young children. And you could still have pictures and put together rhymes. Americans don't rhyme anymore because the rhymes are all so used up. I mean, they pretty much are. It's very difficult. I mean, that's why the sonnets have sort of dissipated. Since he was five, he was reading books. Oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah. Oh, but it has replacement windows, which is where it should go. What is this? This is actually a spray down. Oh, so I did the cake. It's a shot to the better reading. Okay, I'm going to pass. Where are they living in Cape Cod? Now she's in Mashpee. Now that's where the Indians are. Yeah. But, uh, you know who lived at Cape Cod? So this is... Are you doing a plan? Is it a plan? Okay. Okay.